be seated. As we did last week, we are just going to jump right in. Um, we're going to spend just a second in review, and then we'll get down to the to the nitty gritty of it all. Um, can I get uh, someone to help me out here for a second? I, I got a handout tonight. And uh, let me put this mic back here. Now, this is this. These are not my notes, but we're going to be referring to this in just a little while, okay? So, um, and by the way, if um, I understand that the information that I'm I'm kind of throwing at you can be a wee bit much sometimes, and it, it can be like drinking water from a fire hose, especially if, if you're not, you know, used to it or, or I'm going a little uh, deep than, or deeper than what you personally are used to. And some of you might even be deeper than this, and, and that's perfectly fine. But I, I was talking to a couple of people Sunday, and they were like, Man, I'm really digging this, but sometimes you're shooting over my head. I never mind um, sharing my notes with you. And if you, want to, if you want me to email my notes to you, I don't mind doing that at all. All you need to do is just shoot me an email and say, hey, do you mind sending me your notes? I will gladly share them with you. You can go back. You can look at all the Bible verses on your own. Um, and, and get all that stuff and, and soak everything in. Inevitably, there's going to be some things that are in my notes that either my eye doesn't catch it as I'm going down or because of time, I don't have time or don't say from up here on the stage. So you can, you can see maybe where my mind was going in, on a couple of things, and if y'all really understand where my mind is going, then... In a lot of cases, you're better than me because I don't understand where it goes. Um, so, a couple of things on review. There are two schools of thought. If you'll remember going back to Genesis 1 and, and tonight's week 3. So, we're going to go back and kind of catch up a little bit just to get everything back in our minds. But there's two schools of thought on the creation account. If you'll remember, I gave you a challenge on night one to find where in Genesis 1 it says that God created water and land. It wasn't there. And so we, uh, he separated the water so that land would appear, but there wasn't anything there that said that God created water or land. So there's a couple of different viewpoints. Um, one is just that there are three uh, kind of a, a wide angle and then zeroing in and then coming in really close because you've got in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that could be the entire uh, creation account all in one verse. And then the rest of chapter one kind of zooms in a little further. And then as we go into chapter two, it gets really close and, and you start getting into some of the particulars. Um, neither viewpoint, uh, whether it's that one or where, uh, whether you, there is, which a lot of theologians believe, is that there was land and water prior to um, this, uh, the, the account that's listed in Genesis. And we know that land and water aren't mentioned in that six day creation account. So, one way or the other, there has to be something there. So um, they, they think, okay, well, maybe there was a, 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 a certain amount of earth prior to Genesis 1, and then God covered all of that with a cataclysmic flood, and then we, we see the actual six days of creation. Whichever way you go, and I will leave that completely between you and the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to direct you to one way or the other, 
because there are, there are scripture, it, more than one, passages to back up both of those. Okay? So, um, but whichever way you go, neither of them does away with the six days of creation simply because land and water aren't listed as being created in the six days that's through the rest of Genesis 1. It, the, the water's there and we see the spirit hovering over it in Genesis 1, 2. All right, so that's, that's the first point of review. The first blessing in Scripture is mentioned on day five of the, of the six-day creation account when God tells animals to be fruitful and multiply. And then on day six, when he creates man, he gives man the exact same blessing. So to bless, according to Scripture, is literally to multiply. It's to bring to abundance. It, um, so, you know, a lot of people say, well, um, you know, I, somebody blessed me by bringing a casserole. They might have brought to abundance your waistline. But as far as that being a biblical blessing, it's not really a, a blessing by the biblical definition, although it is a blessing. So, I'm not taken away from that in any stretch. It's just when Scripture, especially when you're looking at the charge given to the Levites at the tabernacle, they, one of the charges that was given to them was to simply bless the people. And when, where that goes, it is to multiply or to bring about a, a, an abundance of the way that you speak over people. Think about the Aaronic blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, all of those different types of things. So it is bringing to abundance what you speak over others. Um, Adam and Eve fall out of covenant. And I want to write this word back up here on the board because as we said in week one, everything was about this thing called covenant. So um, you can almost look at the entirety of Scripture and somehow, some way, it can point back to this word. It might be loosely associated or it might be directly, but somehow, some way, it can all come back to covenant. We, we talked about how um, even Adam and Eve covering their midsection was a way of somehow instinctively knowing that the, the part of their bodies that signified this covenant, a covenant of purity with the Lord had been broken. It had been severed. And somehow, some way, they knew that that's what had to be covered. That was, that was uh, the part that brought shame on them. Um, Catching up with myself on my notes. There were the characteristics of Baal, Moloch, and Ishtar. Um, Baal turns people away from God. Moloch is the, the God that, or little g God, by the way, the little g God that uh, the Israelites, as well as others, would sacrifice their babies by rolling them off into the fire down the arms. And then Ishtar, who... Her name is where we actually get the word Easter, but Ishtar was a goddess of sexual perversion. Um, and I, I don't know that I went this far uh, on week one, but she was uh, in, in her statues and um, in her folklore, the things that were written about her, her legend, she was a woman who looked like a man and was known for um, changing men into women, women into men. Um, does that sound familiar? Okay. So we'll just leave it at that. Um, and then also, the play, I had, uh, and I think it was uh, Lori Plude maybe that asked me after week one. She said, Kevin, she said, why was it, do you, or no, last week. She said, Kevin, why was it, do you think, that Adam and Eve didn't have kids before the fall? 
And my answer was simple, and I meant to say this actually during last week's lesson, and I didn't. It was one of those things that kind of blew over my notes. But the, the ultimate plan of Lucifer was for exactly what happened to happen in that Adam and Eve would, would break covenant with the Lord before they had kids, but then what he what Lucifer wanted them to do was in a fallen state to eat of the tree of life because God had established a law with the tree of life in that anyone that ate of the tree of life would live forever. So that's why I said, and I think I did say this last week, that before they could eat of the tree of life, because had they eaten of the tree of life in a fallen state, it would have made redemption impossible. Not that God couldn't redeem them because he certainly had the power to, but he had already set in motion a law that said that anybody that eats of the tree of life lives forever. That's why it's called the tree of life. And so had they eaten of the tree of life in a dead covenant state, they would have, then redemption would have been impossible. So what did God do? He banished them from the garden and he placed two cherubim on either side of the tree and a flaming sword that flashed back and forth all around the tree so that they couldn't get to it. And you can actually look at the bottom of, I believe it's chapter 3 of Genesis, and, it's, and you see the Trinity there basically carrying on a conversation. And God says to each other, he says, we have to do something about this because now they've become like us in that they know the difference between good and evil. They're not innocent anymore. And so unless we do something, they're going to live forever in this fallen state. And so death, the curse of sin, actually became a blessing because were it not for our ability and the flesh ability to die, we wouldn't be able to live in the eternity of heaven. So prior to the fall, we, we were, the, the, the intent was that we would live forever. However, God foreknew exactly what was going to happen, and he made provision for it. And so that's really, in, in that we see God pronounce the first prophecy. He tells Satan, you will strike uh, her seed's heel, but he will crush your head. And that was a prophecy of the person of Jesus Christ in, that, that wouldn't take place for another about 4,000 years. So, there we go. We're caught up now, and now we're going to look at Genesis chapter 6, and this is where we left off last week, but we're going to add another verse or two to it that we didn't read last week. So Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, and again, I believe Shirley has these on the screen for you. Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. Now, I want to stop right there and interject this one point. So you have to, put, you have to see this verse from God's perspective. He sees that... And Scripture calls them, depending on the translation, a lot of a lot of it says the sons of God um, came and had sexual relations with the daughters of men. Sons of God there weren't like um, the good angels; they were the demons. And what happened as a result is these evil, half breed, half demon, half human babies were born. And God looked down and he sees this and he's like, you, you have to understand from a holiness perspective, if we can try to understand that in our human mind, that had to grieve the heart of God. It had to sadden him beyond belief to see what had happened. And he was saying, 
my spirit is not going to, I, I, I can't strive with them because what has resulted is this evil, evil offspring. And he could not allow his spirit to strive with man any longer. And then he goes on in the very next verse and he says, so this is going to be the plan. He says, in picking up in there in the middle of verse 3, in the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. Now, you'll have to remember, prior to this, you had like Methuselah, 969 years old. You had these guys living uh, six, eight, nine hundred years. Adam himself, anybody remember how old Adam was when he died? 930. I was just, okay. I, I, something just crossed my mind. So you, you want to see uh, something to, that, for, for me, when it comes to numbers, and we're going to look at numbers here in just a minute, but I'm going to give you a little, a little thing with a, with a number that might blow your mind. So Jesus says that in the millennial reign, He's going, or he is the second Adam and will rule from David's throne, right? Even the Hebrew word translated to Adam or Adama has A, D, and M in it. Adam, David, Messiah. All three letters in, in that word. And Adam lived 930 years. Anybody want to guess how, how long David lived? 70. What, do, what does 930 equal, and, and 70 equal? A thousand. He's going to reign for a thousand years when he comes back. You can't make that up. All right, so anyway, now we're going to pick up in verse 4. In those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth, for whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. So here in verse 4, we see not only are these evil men that are born out of this unholy union between demons and humans, but now they're heroes. They're, they're revered. They're celebrated. Moving on, verse 5. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and what? Totally evil. So the Lord was... Now, your, your version may even say, so the Lord repented. Did God ever sin that he would need to repent? No. What that means is the old Hebrew word is called nakam. And nakam is actually a hard Hebrew word to translate into English because the full definition of nakam would almost take two or three sentences to properly communicate in, in English. So here is uh, a little bit of what Nakam meant. So Nakam basically means or uh, it means or God sighed within himself or that God regretted. This is the Hebrew word Nakam, which is nearly impossible to translate adequately into English. It's a word that expresses grief, comfort, compassion, and hope all at the same time. God felt all of these emotions over the creation of man. God's heart was filled with sorrow, compassion, and hope, not simply anger. So you, I, I, I've, I've heard it almost basically all of my life, that, well, God flooded the whole earth just because he got angry. No, there's more than that. You can't stop there. You cannot simply say God got angry and put a period right after the sentence because the Hebrew word means more than that. 
It means that God had hope. It means that he also had compassion. Anger, yes. But it was so much more than just that. So then why on earth would God flood the earth if there was actually hope that he felt? Hopefully by the end of tonight, you're going to see that. Moving on. So he, he was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth, and it broke his heart. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. But Noah found what? Favor with the Lord, or in the eyes of the Lord, your translation may say. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the what? Only blameless person living on the earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. So Noah's wife wasn't righteous, and neither was Noah's three sons and their wives. They all got on the ark because of Noah's righteousness. There is, um, there is a word that I want you guys to remember other than covenant. And I won't leave this word up here long. But this word is very important too. Can everybody see that if not up here on the screen maybe? Dominion. When Adam and Eve were created, Adam was, Adam was given dominion over the earth. He was told that he could name the animals, and furthermore, God would abide by whatever Adam named them. It, it, God had every right to name the animals he created them, right? But here is what you need to understand. From the beginning of time, and you can look throughout the entirety of Scripture, God always invites humans into the process. Not because he has to, because he wants to. Because he wants fellowship with us. And that fellowship involves communication. It involves I'll be your God, but you'll be my people if you carry out the commands that I tell you. So I'm going to be your God, but the way that you, the way you're part of this transaction is you obey my commands. The entire relationship process, think about your relationship with your wife, your relationship with your friends, your kids, any relationship you have is always transactional. You love, there is love in return in most cases. There are some exceptions. But that whole entire idea was God's first. God first loved us, we love him in return. God gave his life for us, we give our lives for him. God does what only he can do, and we do what we can do. Adam couldn't have created the animals, but he could name them. And God gave him that right and that privilege as part of the creation process. God gave them life. He gave them their life blood. He gave them everything that only he could give them. And he said, but Adam... You know what? Because I love you, I'm going to let you name them. And whatever name you give them, that's what I'll call them to. And so he did. So what the devil did was he took Adam's birthright away from him over food. Can you think of another Bible story that might have done that? Two guys named Jacob and Esau. 
Jacob is in the kitchen cooking some stew. Esau comes in and he's hungry. And he trades his birthright. It was nothing new. Adam did it, or Adam and Eve both did it in the garden. So as a result, everything that Adam had dominion over was was carried on carried the same curse that Adam had. Everybody understand dominion now? You're kind of you're you're following on what someone else has done for you. So Noah's family gets on the ark because they're under Noah's dominion. We get into heaven because we're under the dominion of Jesus. It's not our righteousness, it's his. His is the only righteousness we can claim. It is his dominion over us that we claim, and yet we get to share in his, inher- in his inheritance. Noah's family got to share in his inheritance of life and not suffer death because of Noah's righteousness when they didn't have any. Noah was the only blameless person. That's what Scripture says. So Nephilite DNA permeated the entire globe. Remember that by chapter 6, man's population was nowhere near what we know it now to be. So for it to populate, to, to permeate the entire mankind existence was not that was not that big of a feat. I mean, granted, by chapter 6, there had been a good bit of population grown. Nobody really knows how many. Scripture doesn't tell us. But we could certainly surmise just by, 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 by the sheer you know, num- expanse of time that it wasn't what we know it is today and in the billions. Noah, though, all the way back then, somehow jumps through time and plays a significant role in eschatology. How? Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39 says this, For it will be like it was in the days of Noah when the Son of Man appears. Verse 38, Before the flood, people lived their lives eating, drinking, marrying, and having children. They didn't realize the end was near until Noah entered the ark, and then suddenly the flood came and took them all away in judgment. It will happen the same way when the Son of Man appears. Now, there are three characteristics of mankind in Noah's day. Number one, sin was rampant to the level of overwhelming chaos. Think about, you remember how... um, the, in, the, uh, in Genesis 1-2, it says, and the earth was formless and void. The actual Hebrew word for formless can be also translated chaos. As a matter of fact, in the exact same word later on in the Old Testament is translated as the word chaos in several different places. So the, the chaos... That is there, and that's another reason why some theologians believe that there was a, you know, this thing that was going on, and and that the darkness that covered the globe was evil is because God's not the author of confusion, right? And if God's not the author of confusion, where did the chaos come from? Because God's not going to create something that's not of Him. That's if you'll remember my personal belief is that God's not going to create darkness when everything about God is light. He's not going to create sin when everything about him is holy. He's not going to create chaos when everything about him or when nothing about him is chaotic. So God God isn't going to give, uh, we'll put it this way, uh, what what child asked for a fish and, and is given a scorpion? God's not going to give a scorpion. He's going to be a good God. He's going to give good gifts. He's not going to give something that's chaotic. That's carried all the way through Scripture. Okay, Uh, so sin was rampant to the level of chaos. Number two, humanity was a a race of half-breeds. Remember? Demon and human, the the Nephilim or the Nephilites. They were half-breed demon and human. Now, I want to call your attention to something. Right now, already in existence, they are putting chips into the brains of human people 
such that if you have if you don't believe me go home google it Elon Musk, the head of Tesla, has developed a chip that they implanted into the brain of a human being who was a paraplegic. And there's video of this guy who was a paraplegic with this chip in his brain getting up and moving around and walking. Now, you say, well, Kevin, what person in their right mind would ever want to receive the mark of the beast? Probably nobody if they're a believer, but let me ask you something. How many of you in this room have people who are loved ones who are either paraplegics or maybe they've got Parkinson's or maybe they've got cancer or maybe they've got some other diabetes. I'm a diabetic. Maybe they've got some other debilitating disease that, that someone could claim, okay, well, if you just get this chip in your brain, it'll handle all that. Can you imagine the line of people that would go and sign up for that? And you know what they you know what they compare the chip surgery to? LASIK. LASIK eye surgery. It's that simple and that fast. Boop, you're in and out. Be well. They they say that that this chip will be able to connect to the cloud just like your phone does. Want to learn Spanish? Go out there on the cloud and pay $39.99 and Spanish will download to your chip and you'll be speaking Spanish in about 30 seconds. You know how they say that someone that receives the mark of the beast will never be able to accept Jesus? I've always wondered how that could happen. Well, here's the truth of the matter. If they can download Spanish into your brain and they can write memories into your brain that never existed, guess what they can also do? Take it away. Somebody's out there and they're thinking about Jesus and someone's witness to them that don't have this chip in their head and all of your thoughts are coming up on some big mainframe that's connected to Big Brother and, and like they have what's called bots. I don't know if you've ever heard about those, but they're a thing. They have been a thing on the internet now for decades, but they, it's these little things that troll the internet and they look for key words and they're attracted to it. So if, they, if, if these bots ever see the word Jesus, going across somebody's brain all they have to be all they have to do is be programmed to delete it and you forgot you ever even heard the name Jesus much less have a chance to accept him and you say well Kevin that sounds like something out of a sci-fi novel it's not it's here right now and they're using AI to do it they are saying that by the year 2030 that's only six years away, that they will be able to completely eradicate every single disease and that man will be able to live forever by the year 2030. Klaus Schwab, the head of the uh, World Economic Forum, made that statement on video. You can go out there and look at it anytime you want. It's on video, and these kinds of things are happening all around us. We have to take note as it was in the days of Noah. And then the third thing that was happening during Noah's day, people lived incredibly long lives. Jared Kushner, Donald Trump's son-in-law, that's married to Ivanka, he was recently quoted as saying that he is doing his best to stay incredibly physically fit because he expects in his lifetime for advancements in technology to make it possible to live forever. It's not far off anymore. It's not that all this stuff is, you know, within the same area we are. It's on the front doorstep. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes again. Genesis 6, 11 through 22. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world for everyone else, remember, except Noah, on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the, ba make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Now, 
The other day, I called my mom, and I was going through this particular passage, and I because you know I'm a numbers guy. And I'm like, Mom, there's got to be something here. There's the 450 feet long. There's the 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall. And I'm like, you know, I was trying to divide it and multiply it, and, and I, nothing was working. And then today, I'm in my office, and I'm going over things for tonight. And God said, hey, Kevin, you know that question you had about all this? He said, you forgot one thing. I didn't give measurements to Noah in feet. I gave them in cubits. Let me show you. So, God tells Noah, and y'all, I am not an artist. I get that. I didn't even take an art class in high school, so my art stinks. So, for right now, this is my rendering of an arc. Front end, back end, down yonder, all right? The length of the arc was 300 cubits. The width of the arc was 50. The height of the arc, and I'm just going to kind of put it this way, was 30 cubits. You have on your sheet... The number of the sovereignty of God, it goes all the way through Scripture, is three. You take any one of those numbers, and I wrote it down for you because I want you to test me on this, okay? Go out and read your own Bible. Test, test it. It, it. It's worked every time for me. You say, well, Kevin, 300, that's three times 100. Well, actually, you have... 100 is 10 times 10. What does 10 mean? Covenant. We've been talking about it right here. It's been what's been right in our face all along. The covenant times the covenant is 100. You, it, it is God saying, I am building a covenant on top of a covenant. And then I'm going to multiply it by my sovereignty. And I'm going to save the only righteous person on the earth. And I'm going to make covenant with him and his family. What's the number five mean? Multiplied by the covenant. The number three, again, the sovereignty of God multiplied by covenant. And what is 30 next to 300? It's one-tenth. What else is a tenth? The tithe. You know what the tithe represents? Our financial covenant to God. It is... For it says, as a man is, or, or as a, uh, what, uh, what's the verse? Goodness, it just went out of my head. Uh, as, uh, wasn't meant for me to say it right then. I can tell you that right now. Okay, so we're going to move on. Oh, and by the way, there were these little slits that Noah, was put, that Noah put in the ark. They were 18, uh, 18 inches, I think, that, or 18 feet. You know, how, you know how many cubits that is? One. That means unity with God or God is in priority or one God. So everything about the construction of the ark was, had God's fingerprint all over it. Verse 18, but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. So how did the flood happen? And, and surely I'm not going to come back to that passage. I'm going to move on. How did the flood happen? Well, there was a, um, if you can imagine, I'm going to have to put it up here in this top thing. There was the earth. Okay, so this is the earth. 
Well, all around the earth was a layer of water. And it had never rained before. And this water kept the earth at a constant humidity, a constant temperature all the time. 365 days a year, seven days a week, you can go on and on and on. So what God caused to happen, according to Scripture, is that this imploded globally and all of the springs, fountains that were under the earth burst forth all at the same time. So you had it coming down and up all at the same time, and it says that it did this for 40 days and 40 nights. I even wrote 40 on your, uh, on your sheet. What does 40 mean? Judgment. Remember, Jesus was uh, tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. The children of Israel walked in the wilderness for 40 years. So they, it, it, was, it was all these 40s that go all the way through Scripture. Um, now, one thing that I want to show you, remember I told you that ha me actually even bringing up that there are two different schools of thought about the creation thing would come into play a little bit. Well, here is one of those places that it comes into play. Because this, the fact that God chose water to bury the earth in may give a little bit of credence in the, into some things in the other places. And I use the word may. I'm not saying it does. Because, I, to be honest with you, I don't know. But there is some scriptural reasoning that would lend that, would lend that thought. So this may have been the very thing that happened in the pre-Genesis 1-1 time. So we've already said that many theologians believe that there is enough scripture to suggest that the darkness there in, the, in Genesis 1-2, when the Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters, was actually evil. Well, let me show you something. In Matthew 12, 43, look what it says. It says, when a demon is cast out of a person, it roams around where? A dry region. Well, why, does, why are demons seeking out dry regions? Maybe it's because they were encased in water. And they just don't like the wet stuff. We don't know. Scripture doesn't say but there, this this is one of those this is one of those places that kind of lends toward that toward that thought. Now let's jump back toward Genesis seven, verses eleven through twelve. When Noah was six hundred years old, on the seventeenth day of the second month, all the underground waters erupted from the earth, and the rain fell in mighty torrents from the sky. The rain continued to fall for forty days and forty nights. By the way. This was the first time in history, the first, and we, we talked about the law of first mention. This is the first time in history where morning gave way to evening. Until now, evening was always mentioned before morning. But in the account of the flood, it says it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. There was a judgment that was happening. Until this particular point, death had always given way to life. But now, the life was being buried under a lot of water. Genesis 7, 17. For 40 days, the flood waters grew deeper, covering the ground and lifting the boat above the earth. As the waters rose higher and higher above the ground, the boat floated safely on the surface. And finally, the water covered even the highest mountains on the earth, rising more than 22 feet or 15 cubits. What does 15 mean? Rest. It was as though God was burying everything and he was like, you know what? There's been enough chaos. I just need my creation to be at rest for a moment. So 
So it rose 15 cubits above the highest peaks, and all the living things on earth died, birds, domestic animals, wild animals, small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the people. Everything that breathed and lived on dry land died. God wiped out every living thing on the earth, people, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and the birds of the sky. They were all destroyed, and the only people who survived were Noah and those with him on the boat, and the flood waters covered the earth for 150 days. In other words, God put at rest to bring back in covenant, 15 times 10. Can you imagine what was going through Noah's mind at this particular point? Everything on that he had ever known was being taken away from him. Genesis uh, chapter 8 talks about the ark coming to rest exactly 150 days. There's that rest times covenant thing again after it began to float or five months grace it came to rest on mount ararat in genesis 9 1 it says then god blessed noah and his sons and told them to be fruitful and multiply there it is again blessing means multiplication Genesis 9, 8 through 11, Then God told Noah and his sons, I hereby confirm my covenant. God made a covenant with Adam. It was broken. Now God's making a covenant with Noah. He said, I hereby confirm my covenant with you and your descendants. Are you a descendant of Noah? Okay, good. And with all the animals that were on the boat with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, every living creature on earth, yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. God said it twice. He didn't just say it once. He said it twice. Never again will what? Floodwaters kill all living creatures. Ah, but earth will be destroyed again. Second Peter 3, 5 through 7 puts it this way, but they conveniently overlooked that from the beginning the heavens and earth were created by God's word. He spoke, there's the word, Jesus, the living word. He spoke and the dry ground separated from the waters. Then long afterward he destroyed the world with a tremendous flood by those very waters. And now by the same powerful word, the heavens and the earth are reserved for it's not coming by water this time. It's coming by fire. Genesis 9, 16 through 17. I call this Roxy's verse. I saw this verse about a week and a half before my dog Roxy passed away. And oh my goodness, am I glad I saw it. It's now on the front of a book that Jack Riley made that her ashes are in. Genesis 9, 16. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. It's not a covenant between God and man. It's a covenant with even creation itself. The cross didn't just redeem me and you back to God. It redeemed our, our relationship. But guess what? Because we are redeemed and the animals are under our dominion, they're redeemed too. Romans puts it this way. All creation is waiting the day to rejoice with us in the glorious things that are awaiting us. So 40 days of mourning giving way to evening. And once again, evening gives way to morning. I'll see you next week.